Yes. A myth is born in 2008, uh, Ed Critzler published his best bestseller, uh, Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, Ed Critzler, I must say, according to everyone we spoke to, uh, to about uh, Ed Critzler, uh, was a very uh, nice man, a very bubbly, um, friendly, full of stories, and uh, maybe that's how you should be remembered uh, as a great storyteller. And not long after he published his book, he, uh, he passed away, so he hasn't been able to reap the benefits of it. Um, I must say, Jewish pirates uh, did not seem to exist before 2008, before at Kretzler published his book. There was talk of uh, Lafitte now and then, but um, since ever since uh, uh, the publication of Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the book has uh, uh, conquered a lot of terrain. It's all over the internet. Uh, the book sold well. There are a lot of articles goals, uh, presentations, even a film has been made about uh, Jewish pirates. So uh, he touched uh, a nerve there. And personally, I think he fits into a trend, uh, the so-called tough Jew school of history. Uh, recent discoveries have uh, um, have been made about Jewish resistance in the Second World War. Uh, recently, a book has been published about Jewish resistance in the Netherlands um, on a different uh, uh, note. There have been quite a lot of novels uh, about Jewish gangsters, etc., etc., and to, all has to do with uh, um, is the problem of the meek Jew in history. Uh, Jews didn't resist in the Second World War, it was sought, uh, etc., etc. Let's start at the beginning, which is uh, Spain and Iberia. Uh, this is a well-known map, and uh, it has been around for ages. David and I think it's time for a new map. So maybe we will commission one because this is uh, very one-sided. It all starts in Spain and Iberia and uh, the Jews went straight to their uh, place of destination. And there's no interaction between uh, London and Amsterdam, for instance, or uh, Amsterdam and uh, the Levant. Um, not between Morocco and the Netherlands. And in fact, there was a lot of movement in between places of the Western uh, and Eastern Sephardic diaspora. It started in uh, 1492, uh, a first wave of uh, Jews went to Morocco. Those were the ones who never converted and uh, remain Jews uh, ever after. And there was an early migration to Antwerp and to Pisa, and from Pisa to Livorno. Jews then at the end of the 16th century started to settle in Southern France, and also in Hamburg. And from 1600, they went in droves to Amsterdam and from 16, 56 also to London. This is the um, Western Sephardic diaspora, and it consisted mostly of Jews who had gone through Portugal, but not all of them were from, uh, from Portugal. There were also Spanish ones, uh, Morocco ones, Italian ones. Um, but they have in common that they went through Portugal. There's a more modern map 
provided by the website uh, Empire Between Nations from a group of scholars in uh, Portugal. Um, very nice website. And this map looks more up to date than the ones that have been, uh, that, has, that you have seen earlier. Uh, this shows you the um, Sefadi diaspora coming from uh, Portugal, London, Africa to uh, the New World. Yeah. It started all with uh, movements from Holland to Brazil from 1630 to the end of it in 1654. And you could find uh, Jews in Brazil and only in Brazil uh, until uh, the year 1654. I'm not speaking here about, about conversos, that's a different story. In 1654, the Dutch occupation of uh, Brazil came to an end. And then some Jews went from Brazil to New York to Curaçao, to Suriname, but also back to Holland. And then a migration uh, started again from Amsterdam to Curaçao, to the wild coast, to Suriname, Jamaica, Barbados, and the English colonies in North America. And it's not only from Holland, they also came from Hamburg and London later on. It followed um, uh, colonization patterns uh, started by the uh, by the Spanish, the Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, the English, and the French. And uh, one of those who migrated from Holland to uh, to receive is one of the most important figures in uh, uh, Ed Quetzal's uh, book. He is uh, Moses Cohen Henriquez, alias Antonio Vaz Henriquez, according to Quetzal. And this is his life, according to Quetzal. He was born in Portugal, 1601. His father was Antonio Vaz Henriquez, a rich merchant in Lisbon. He was also one of the 155 accused at an auto da fe, he had brother Abraham, some were younger. He spent his years in Holland up to 1624 when he helped capture Bahia and he helped Piet Hein capture the Soviet fleet, uh, captured Recife. And after that, he became a privateer, sold the island Antonio Vaz and Recife to Jorge Maurits of Nassau Ziegen, the ruler of Brazil in 1636. And he went to the Caribbean 1654 um, and uh, continued his privateering ways. He became an advisor to Henry Morgan, the famous pirate and later governor of Jamaica. He was granted naturalization by Henry Morgan, 18 November, 1681. His wife, Esther, is buried in Hans Bay Cemetery, Jamaica, sometime between 1692 and 1700. And this is the family tree, according to uh, Impressa. It's, uh, it starts with Antonio Vaz, Henriquez. He had two, uh, two sons, uh, Moses and Abraham and they form a sort of kind and able uh, uh, story in the book by Quetzal. Abraham Cohen married uh, Webka Palash, 1652 received, he had two sons. According to Quetzal, uh, Jacob Cohen was born in 1630 and immediately we see that this is a bit of problem since Abraham Cohen married Rebka in 1652. And according to Gritzer, uh, Abraham Cohen uh, was married to someone else before. And he also had a daughter, Eva Cohen, who 
makes a cameo appearance in the book because a pamphlet was written about her in 1681 in London about her conversion to uh, Christianity. And the pamphlet is important because Chris, Chris, uh, cites it somewhere in the most ingenious way. Um, Eva Cohen was a brother of Jacob Cohen, and Jacob Cohen was in the service of your Maus of Nassau Siegen and uh, worked at the Spellers in The Hague, the Maus house now. And there, Eva Cohen met the servant of her brother, a Michael Verboon, and she uh, fell in love with him, converted to Christianity, went off to London. And uh, uh, the pamphlet tells all about her tribulations. So the central characters in the book are uh, Moses and Abraham, brothers. And Ed Kritzer is a storyteller, so he introduces, like I said, this kind and Abel theme in, in the story where Moses and Abraham at the end of their lives stand uh, um, over a piece of land and quarrel about it. Um, I will make it clear that he confuses uh, several uh, people uh, uh, and he takes his family tree from no less than three different Cohen families. One is Cohen Henriquez, another is Cohen do Brasil, and uh, last family is a family that sim that's simply called Cohen. And um, Abraham Cohen actually is a composite of four characters. Let's start with the marriage of Moses Cohen Henriquez and Rachel uh, Espinosa and Spinoza. Um, Moses Cohen did exist. He uh, was born in Antiquera as his marriage band says here. And Antiquera is in Spain, not in Portugal. So there we have the first difference with uh, Moses Cohen Henriquez as sketched by uh, uh, Ed Kritzer. And his father is Francisco Vaz de Leon, not Antonio Vaz Henriquez. And his wife is Rachel, not Esther. Let's see if we can find more. <clears throat> the, at the start of it all is a, uh, uh, a narrative written up by a, a certain Esteban de Ares Fonseca in Madrid. And uh, this narrative was sent to the King of Spain. And it was uh, entitled, uh, it, it showed the damage done to his majesty by the Jews of Holland. It was copied and translated into Castilian from uh, Portuguese. And it ended up in the uh, general uh, inquisition archives of Simancas, uh, where it was found, found by Henry Leon. You can find the reference to it in Lia's History of the Inquisition of Spain, and um, there it was found by Cyrus Arto, who asked for a copy from Henry Lia. He got it, and he published it in uh, a journal with the name, uh, with the name uh, Publications of the Jewish S Historical Society of America. In, 1909. Um, this, uh, as the Banda Ares Fonseca had several conspiracy theories, and the main one of that was the Dutch West India Company was controlled by Jews who were large stockholders, and the chief profits were derived from piracy in the colonies. And um, 
there are several statements that um, are incorrect. It is true that a few Jews were large stockholders of the Dutch West India Company, but it was not controlled by Jews. The gentleman 17 who ruled uh, the Dutch West Indian Company were all Protestant Dutch. And we'll see about the piracy. Moses Cohen Harikes, according to uh, Kretzer, uh, took part in the capture of uh, Recife in 1630. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the text had, that he published. And above, you can see the original from Cyrus Adler. And uh, at the bottom, Kretzer speaks about Moses Cohen Henriques. But the original, cited by Adler, and I have no doubt that he was correct, talks about one Antonio Vaz Henriques also Mosen Cohen. Well, it could be that this is our Moses Cohen Henriques. My, po my point here is that uh, it's not what it says. It has been doctored by Kretzer who maybe felt insecure about this citation and if he could get away with it. And meanwhile, in 1630, like in years before and years after, Moses Cohen Henriques was in Holland. Uh, I found his name throughout text registers uh, of the Portuguese Jews in Holland above is uh, uh, 1629, below that is 1630. And then in between he is mentioned uh, a few times uh, in 1631, 32, 34, and in 1636, bottom left, and 1640, bottom right. Now it could be that Moses Cohen Harik has uh, sailed up and down from uh, Holland uh, to his privateering uh, business in uh, and receive and then sailed back in time to pay his taxes. But if you look at the amounts, then uh, he didn't earn very, uh, very much from his privateering business because, uh, well, a few guilders a year. He is not at the top of the tax paying Dutch in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam. Another citation. It is not known how many enemy ships Moses seized, but Dutch privateers in the New World were very successful. And then he mentions the years and how many ships were captured, 547. And the source is uh, Arnold Wisnitzer, one of the uh, early publishers about uh, Dutch Jews of uh, Brazil. He wrote a very interesting book, uh, the, Jews, the, the Jews of Brazil. And uh, you can see that this is the, uh, the place where the citation comes from because he also mentions 547 Iberian ships captured, but not by uh, Moses Cohen, I guess, and not by the West India Company. But, but, sorry, not by Moses Cohen Arikes and not by privateers, but by the West India Company. The West India Company were the real rulers of Brazil. It was a private company and they uh, had the permission of the Dutch government to uh, have their own army, their own fleet, their own soldiers, their own marines, and they were constantly at war with the Portuguese who, and the Spanish who tried to take Brazil back from the, from the Dutch. Um, so in this war, the West Indian Company captured these ship, 
ships. Uh, as a business enterprise, this wasn't going very well because the costs of keeping a, an army and the fleet were not covered by uh, uh, by the loot that they took from the from the Spanish and the Portuguese. But there's an, uh, another inter interesting uh, thing here. It is not known how many uh, ships Moses seized. Well, uh, if Ed Gritzler had found evidence of a single ship that Moses had seized, he would have mentioned it, but apparently he didn't. <clears throat> Moses Cohen Henriquez died on Barbados and he died before the year 1665. This is an entry from the all important uh, uh, Escamot A from Amsterdam, the minute book of the Portuguese Jewish uh, community in Amsterdam. And it tells us about Moses Kuhn Henriques and his brother Jacob Kuhn Henriques. They lived on Barbados and he asked for uh, religious uh, um, uh, how do you call it uh, a Sefer Torah and its cape and uh, all that belonged to it and that Sefer Torah had been in the family it was owned by the father Abraham Cohen Henriquez um, the community in Amsterdam granted that request and it was sent to Barbados. Maybe it's still there. A year earlier, the uh, brothers had also asked for a lamp that had been in the possession of the family. And maybe it's this lamp, bottom left. It could be that it's still there. Um, but what this entry also says is that Moses Cohen Henriquez is dead. In the uh, title, it says, Good deals, them. He is in the hands of God. According to Kritzler, Moses Cohen Harikas lived on to become a, um, an, an advisor of Henry Morgan, the famous pirate. And uh, later, he was governor of Jamaica. So let's take a look again at the story about Kritzler, uh, born Portugal, etc. And my own findings uh, from an inquisitorial deposition by the brother of Moses, another brother not mentioned by uh, Ed Kritzler, Isaac Cohen Harikas. Um, it is known that Moses Cohen Harikas was born in Spain, Antiquera, as we already also saw from the marriage ban, but he was much younger. He must have been born in 1611, 1612. His father is not Antonio Vaz. His father is Francisco Vaz de Leon, who took the, the Jewish name of Abraham Cohen, I guess once he landed safely in Holland. Kretzler uh, goes on to say that Antonio Vaz Henriquez is mentioned in, uh, in an auto da fe in Lisbon in 1605, among 154 other names. I looked up that auto da fe, it's online on the uh, website of uh, Dora de Tombo. Uh, I read all 155 names, but there's no Antonio Vaz Henriquez among them. Um, we have a riddle here. We will post uh, those uh, uh, pages on the Sephardic uh, Diaspora so you can see for yourself. Next. Uh, uh, I established that uh, Cohen Henriquez lived in Holland until 1640, 41 at least. He paid his taxes, he signed the Eskimo of the community, 
he had various uh, religious functions within the community. Um, but Kretzler, meantime, says that he helped capture Bahia in 1624. It was an early um, attempt by the WIC to uh, invade Brazil, and it failed. They couldn't uh, hold on to Bahia. And the one who helped capture them, Bahia, was not Moses Cohen. It was Samuel Cohen who was a school teacher in Amsterdam. He was hired by the West Indian Company as an interpreter, and he uh, interpreted in uh, in, Bahia in 1624 uh, from Portuguese to, uh, uh, to Dutch. And Moses Cohen Henrik has also helped capture the silver fleet, so at states. Um, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it could be, but we have to keep in mind that the real Moses Cohen Henriquez was born in 1611, uh, 1612. He would have been old enough to be a cabin boy by 1628, or maybe a very young soldier. Um, he would not have had the experience needed to guide Piet Hein to capture the silver fleet, I think. And the information about this comes from this Esteban, who we saw earlier from his uh, narrative about uh, uh, Dutch Jews uh, damaging Spanish interests. He also told about the capture of the silver fleet and mentioned uh, Moses Cohen uh, there. But he also mentions later on in that narrative, uh, Moses Cohen Pike Soto. So maybe it was that Moses who helped capture the silver fleet. It's a possibility, but um, I don't think uh, there's much to it. We talked about receive, we talked about uh, privateer, he did, uh, he did not privateer, I think, or else he would not have been able to pay his taxes in Amsterdam. There's no evidence that he ever sold the island Antonio Vaz to Johan Maurits van Nassau Ziegen. Anyway, the Dutch captured, captured Antonio Vaz, which is situated uh, uh, near Recife and blocking the harbor there. Um, they captured it in 1630, immediately built a fort there, and uh, I don't think they paid anyone anything for the island. But uh, Ed Kressel does not deliver proof, no evidence, no citation, no nothing. The same uh, goes for uh, him being an advisor to Henry Morgan. There's no footnotes in a book that's full of footnotes. That uh, there's no reference to literature. There's no even reference to archives. Uh, there was only one thing that's uh, a naturalization document of a Moses Cohen, and Moses Cohen signed that uh, paper in 1681. Um, I think that must have been a different Cohen then, because we saw that Moses Cohen Henriquez died on Barbados. So let's look at the different Cohen fam families from which Kretzer uh, took bits and pieces. And to say the least, uh, Sephardic genealogy is not an easy business. A uh, lot of names are the same Cohen there were a dozen Cohen families in Amsterdam at that time alone, uh, let alone elsewhere. Um, they all will have the same given names. The first one to leave Iberia was called Abraham, and he named the sons after the uh, patriarchs, Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, etc. And 
the name and pattern of the uh, Portuguese Jews was such that the grand, first grandson was named Abraham. So if someone had five sons and they all had children, they all had sons, after one or two generations, there will be five Abraham Cohens. Not in this case, though. But that explains why very few given names uh, um, appear in uh, Sephardic genealogy. So you have to know your name around. I don't think that Ed, Chris, Ed Critzler was very interested in genealogy. He was more interested in storytelling, which he did well. So I added here uh, um, some signatures of the people involved. There's a son, Isaac, and his uh, Spanish name was Antonio Henriquez. He had an adventurous life. Um, he came he was born in Antequera, came with his father and brothers to, uh, to Saint-Jean-de-Luz, a way station on the way to Amsterdam. And from there, the family arrived in 1617 in Amsterdam. Thereupon, Abraham uh, Henriquez, alias Francisco Vaz de Leon, took the name Abraham Israel Henriquez. And to the right, you see the same person signing as Abraham Cohen Henriquez. This happened because he met a priest on one of of his uh, business trips to Latin America and the priest, or maybe uh, um, maybe a real Cohen, because the term that uh, is in the Inquisition archives is sacerdote. Uh, that such sacerdote told Abraham as well, Henriquez, that he was really a Cohen whereupon Abraham took the name Abraham Cohen Henriquez. He was an important figure in uh, Bet Israel, one of the three starting communities of the Amsterdam uh, Portuguese uh, existence in Amsterdam, uh, contributing lots of money. And below, to the right below are the names of Jacob Cohen Henriquez and Moses Cohen, Cohen Henriquez under the Eskimo of 1648 or 1649 of Recife in Brazil. So they really were in Brazil. Uh, Jacob was there from 1644 when, he, uh, when we first see his name appear there. Uh, Antonio Henriquez told in his deposition before the Inquisition that he was in Brazil way before that, uh, 1640, and Moses Cohen Henriquez uh, came in between uh, 1642. And what they did there was uh, they became slave traders. We find their names under. Uh, it, the names of those trading in slaves in the archives of the West Indian Company. A profitable business, but a questionable one. Here is the deposition of this uh, Antonio Henriquez, alias Isaac Cohen Henriquez. And uh, he mentions his uh, parents, Francisco Vaz de Leao, or Leon, born in Covilia which is in Portugal, and Dona Beatrice de Tovar, and he uh, um, names the names of his brothers and sisters, among them Moses Cohen Henriquez, whose alias, or Spanish name, was uh, uh, Rodrigo Vaz de Leon. <coughs> And he also tells the story about uh, uh, that such uh, daughter uh, uh, to, uh, to Abraham, who was the uh, 
uh, who's <clears throat> sorry, lost my way here. <laughs> um, we told the story that Abraham as well, uh, Harry Kess, who was really a Cohen. Abraham Cohen Harry Kess, uh, died in 1738. We see his signature under his last will. And you can see that it's all over the place, causing the notary to put a note around it, which basically says this is really the signature of Abraham Cohen Henry Kess. And to the right, you see what is this said, said, uh, said uh, about him uh, on his grave. The Varao Abraham Cohen Henry Kess. The second family that uh, Kritzer took uh, uh, information from is Cohen do Brazil. It starts with a Mordecai Cohen, whose name we only know from the gravestone of his son Abraham Cohen do Brazil. We don't know where he was born. He uh, uh, around 1605 to 1611, uh, depending on which notarial deed you consult. He was married to Rebecca Palash, who was a grand niece of Samuel Palash, the pirate. And yet, um, five sons, two daughters, and uh, one of them um, um, also appears in the book by uh, Ed Kurtzer. And Abraham Cohen do Brazil is the supposed brother of Moses Cohen Henriquez. And uh, my research shows that he was a son of Mordecai, not of Antonio Vaz Henriquez, that he married. Uh, in 1652 uh, and received that he wasn't married before. And uh, he had a son, Jacob, born in 1653, who also figures in the uh, book by uh, Kretzer as, uh, as a bookkeeper of Joram Maurits. But uh, he was born in 1653 and not in 1630, as Kretzel would have it. And below, we have to the left, we have the signature of Abraham Cohen, and he only signed in Hebrew. And it doesn't, even in Hebrew, it doesn't look anything like this one of Abraham Cohen Henry Kess. Um, next to uh, that is the signature of his son, Jacob Cohen Henriquez from 1675. Mm. And this signature is completely different from the one of Jacob Cohen Henriquez, with whom Quetzal confuses him. This is uh, uh, the epitaph on the grave of Abraham Cohen do Brazil. It is from 1672. And I mentioned that date because uh, it's important in the story of uh, Jewish pirates. Um, Jacob Cohen. The son of Abraham uh, did work for Johan Maritz, Prince of Nassau. He wasn't a prince back when he was uh, in uh, uh, Brazil. He was only a count then. He, he got the title of prince much, at a much later date. But J Jacob, this Jacob Cohen was really in the service of the uh, uh, Prince of Nassau, but not in 1636, as the citation from uh, Quetzal's book has it above. 
he was uh, appointed as bookkeeper of Johan Maurits in 1677, which is 41 years later. But the fact that A. Jacob Bohen was uh, in the service of uh, Johan Maurits of Nassau Siegen has led to a lot of confusion and um, making some people believe that he was already a bookkeeper of Johan Maurits in uh, Recife. And the last family, in this family, uh, only Abraham Cohen is uh, important. And we see his signature from 1661 uh, to the left above. He was a son of Joseph uh, Geronimo Cohen, alias Henriques. But they called themselves e either Cohen or Henriques, but never Cohen Henriques. His father was a Joao alias Luis Cohen. And uh, that one lived in Brazil. So there is a connection to Brazil as well here. This Joseph alias Geronimo Cohen was uh, very important in, in the Amsterdam Jewish community because he was one of those that managed to get uh, the original three communities of Amsterdam to merge into one in 1639. He, he did this uh, sort of clever trick. There was a treaty to be signed between the three communities and he made three copies of that, presented it to the leaders of the different three communities and asked them, each of them, to sign it first. So every community was happy to sign the document first and then uh, no one had to, uh, uh, to uh, give uh, reference to uh, someone else. Um, he was a merchant in Amsterdam, a rich merchant also, but towards the end of his life, he became a uh, impoverished. He died in Rotterdam in the harbor aboard the ship. His son abandoned the estate, uh, put the coffin, coffin with his father on the quay of the harbor of Rotterdam and put the keys of the ship on the ship for anyone who was interested uh, to take it. But if they took the ship, they had to take the depths of Joseph Cohen as well. Here's that signature again of Abraham Cohen. Uh, I found it in Dotar, the charity in Amsterdam, that Dotar dowries to poor orphan girls. And it says here that he is the son of Joseph Cohen. So this uh, Abraham Cohen is mentioned in Kurtzler's book because uh, Ed Kurtzler was convinced that Abraham Cohen do Brazil didn't die in 1672. He faked his own death. And what does uh, Kurtzler do? He points to uh, Abraham Cohen in Tangier, Tanger, um, who operated in the 1670s, around 1675, and said, that is our Abraham uh, Cohen, the brother of Moses Cohen. Um, it would have been difficult for anyone in Amsterdam, even in the 17th century, to fake his own death because everyone had to be involved. So let's go back to uh, all those fam uh, families Cohen. This is the one according to Kretzel with Moses and Abraham Cohen as brothers. And uh, Moses lived on until after 1681, uh, Abraham Cohen died after 1675. Uh, 
and Moses had uh, a sister, Esther. The family Cohen Harikas. Um, in this family, there's no brother pair, Moses and Abraham. There's a father and son, Abraham and Moses. Moses is married to an Esther, not to, uh, to a Rachel, not to an Esther. The next family, Cohen do Brazil. Um, Abraham Cohen has a lot of sons. Joseph, uh, Joseph who died young, Mordecai. Uh, Moses Cohen, who died, as we saw, in, on Barbados, 1665 uh, uh, or before. Jacob Cohen. And there were two sisters as well, but there was not a brother pair, Moses and Abraham. And the father of Moses is also an Abraham here, but he did not seem to have had uh, any brothers. And uh, what I can reveal here also is that this Abraham Cohen was a German Jew, a Tedesco Ashkenazi. And that's why he always signed his name in Hebrew. He had never learned how to write uh, the Portuguese language or any other Latin language. This is confirmed by text lists in the Amsterdam archives where he paid promesas to the Portuguese Jewish community uh, under the names of Abraham Cohen, Abraham Cohen do Brasil, or Abraham Cohen Tudesco. He was never allowed to pay fintas because you, because you could only pay fintas if you were uh, um, a Yehid, a member of the community. And he was never allowed to become a member of that uh, community. But he was buried in Bethlehem. Um, to sum it up, there is no brother pair Moses and Abraham here. And the last family, the only Abraham here was the only son of Joseph uh, Cohen. Uh, so where does this brother pair of um, at Chrysler come from? He found some documents on, uh, in Jamaica, in Jamaican archives uh, about the quarrel about a piece of land uh, owned by two brothers, Abraham and Moses. He started looking for uh, earlier evidence about these Cohen's and from literature, uh, mostly older literature. He pieced together a story about two brothers. Uh, growing up in Amsterdam and fighting their way to their graves. But <clears throat> since both uh, Abraham Cohen Henriques and no, no, Moses Cohen Henriques died in Barbados in 1665 uh, or before, and Abraham Cohen do Brazil died in Amsterdam in 1672. Uh, the Moses and Abraham Cohen on Jamaica in 1675 must have been different persons. Alas, uh, these documents were not uh, published in the book, but he did give uh, uh, references to the archives, so maybe one day we will be able to see them or to look them up. <clears throat> This was uh, the family Cohen. Next, uh, we will talk about Samuel Palash. And I'm talking way too long, I see. <laughs> um, this is the story told by Ed Kretzler. Um, Samuel Palash was in Holland in 1592. He was a founder of one of the Portuguese Jewish communities in Amsterdam. He was a defender of Jews, well loved in Amsterdam. He was a pirate all his life, and he was a of the community. 
he took most of his information from the book by uh, Mercedes Garcia Arenal and uh, Gerard Rivers called Samuel, Samuel Palage, A Man of Three Worlds. That book has been published in six or seven languages now. And this year, a Hebrew version will appear. So it will be very interesting to see that. <clears throat> well, uh, they tell a different story. Uh, Samuel Palash never set foot in Holland before the year 1608. Uh, he was a defender of his family's interest, not of Jewish interests. He was not well loved by his fellow Jews in Amsterdam. He didn't like his maneuvering between uh, the Spanish, the, the Mor Moroccans and the Dutch. Um, he was a privateer, and the privateer, I should have told earlier, is someone who gets a letter of marquee from a government that permits him to, uh, to capture enemy ships, uh, provided that the country he gets his letter from is at war with that other country. He did become, by chance, a one-time pirate. And he was a Chacham on his gravestone only. And Chacham uh, can also mean wise man. So I think that's meant uh, uh, to say on his gravestone, he was a wise man. He certainly was a, a religious leader within the community. So how does uh, Kritzler do that? He relies on uh, all the literature, the literature that has mostly been debunked. He talked about uh, Samuel Palash, who appeared before the walls of Middleburg uh, with a bunch, with uh, a party of Jews uh, asking to be uh, let in and to be able to settle in Middleburg in 1592. That story has been debunked. He tells about the service in Palach's house in 1595. Odette of Lessing, who besides, says there was no service in Palach's house. And what does Quetzal do? He changes the date, but keeps the service and uh, uh, thus keeps the legend upright. He tells about Samuel and Joseph Palach Stalling the case of Fares and Tetuan. But that is a misquote from Herbert Bloom, and he exaggerates the role of Samuel Palash as a pirate, and he invented stories. Um, and how does he do that? By uh, misquoting uh, Garcia, Arenal, and Vigas. Um, I have a quote in the original is above. There came in his company, Martin Reisbergen as ambassador of the States and admiral of the ships. And also with them was Samuel Palash who handled the correspondence between Moulay, Sidam and the Dutch. <clears throat> Moulay, uh, Sidam was the Sultan of Morocco of the time. So, uh, this is about a visit from the Dutch to uh, Morocco, to the Sultan of, uh, of Morocco. Kretzer leaves out the first uh, part of the sentence about Martin Reisbergen as a messenger. <clears throat> and also the part about also with them was Samuel Palash. And replaces it with Palash between brackets. And now it looks as if Palash brought those lances and alfanias and guns and gifts. Further on, uh, Garcia Arno uh, Wiggers had, after Martin de Reisbergen had handed over the cargo, Mulai Sidan ordered him to go with his ships. The third, first part of the sentence is cut out, replaced with wherever poem, Sidan ordered them to go with the ships to uh, uh, 
to capture some, um, sorry, <coughs> some fine Spanish ships. So now it looks like the citation uh, which I copied from Kessel's book, and it looks like Palash was a thousand lances, and like Palash has been ordered to go with his ships to the coast of Spain to make a fine capture of Spanish ships. Um, when you are a storyteller, you tell stories, but when you tell history, you use foot, footnotes and everything you cite has to be pre, a precise citation. So this is somewhere in between, between storytelling and uh, providing footnotes uh, to cover your back. Another uh, example is uh, uh, the Palaka brothers living in the Mela of Tetuan. Above is the citation by uh, Garcia, Arinal, and Vigas, and it tells about the Palaka brothers who were living in Tetuan at the time. Um, sorry, it's, uh, it's a citation by Quetzal, <laughs> not by uh, Garcia, Arinal, and Vigas. He tells about the brothers Palash, uh, strolling up and down the case of Tetuan, and it was said by the compatriots that after a successful cruise, the brothers would brazenly enter Spanish ports, pretending to be innocent traders and boldly seek out buyers for their booty. The citation is from Bloom, and Bloom does not mention the Palaka brothers, he does not mention Tetuan, he does not manage. Uh, uh, mention uh, Spanish ports, he only mentions Amsterdam. And then there's a story about uh, Samuel Palash when he was uh, uh, captured uh, by the English after he had indeed uh, uh, captured some Spanish ships illegally. And the Sp Spanish people wanted his, uh, wanted that the English turned him over to, uh, to, uh, to Spain to be tried as a pirate. And that didn't happen, but the story goes that one day, a Palacas horse the carriage, met the carriage of the Spanish ambassador in The Hague. This is from Wikipedia and it's below. Uh, the two carriage, carriages were unable to pass one another and to cheers from onlookers, the Spanish ambassador's carriage had to make way for the, for the one of Palage. Ritzler transplants the whole scene to London because that fits his narrative better than, uh, than uh, the story taken, taking place in The Hague. Um, again, he is a storyteller, but he takes some liberty with his sources. <clears throat> Enough about the book by Kretzler. Um, to his credit, I must say that uh, Kretzler does not talk about skull and bones much in his book. It's only on the front cover of the book where there's a uh, skull and bone sign uh, on uh, on the image, but uh, other people have they uh, everywhere they found skull and bones on Jewish graves. They turned uh, the ones that were laying under them into one-time pirates. This one is from the forward a respectable Jewish journal, which published three times about uh, the Jewish pirates of Jamaica in uh, the past uh, 10 years or so. And this one um, has offended me greatly. This is about uh, Jewish pirates who once won the, the island. And uh, some people in Jamaica try to uh, to use this story to attract tourists. 
illustrating this article is a gravestone with a skull and bones. What the story does not tell you is that this is the stone of Josio Pardo, who was a Gagan on Jamaica, and he had been there less than a year. He was at that time some 70, 75 years old, we don't know precise. He came from Curaçao, where he had been a Gagan before. And I'm sure he was an honorable uh, Gagan of both Curaçao and Jamaica. From Curaçao, it is known that he uh, uh, promoted uh, proper Jewish life. He uh, uh, established the school and other uh, um, uh, educational uh, charities. Uh, in short, he was very instrumental there in bringing Jewish the proper Jewish life to Curaçao. And he intended, no doubt, to do the same on Jamaica. I can't imagine him as a pirate somehow. That same uh, cross and bones is uh, all over uh, Jewish graves in Amsterdam, in Hamburg, less in London but you can also find it on Curaçao in Jamaica. And it's a vanity symbol. It symbolizes the fleetingness of life. Here you see a skull and bones and an hourglass on the skull, uh, also signifying uh, the fleet, fleetingness of life uh, on the grave of a Texaira de Matos. And, um, I've never heard anyone uh, accused the Xaira de Matos of having been pirates. This is another example of uh, the use of the skull and bones as a vanity symbol in a painting by Benjamin Godinez, one of the few 17th century Jewish painters and uh, a wealthy Portuguese merchant is looking at the decomposing body and some skulls and bones. And he is contemplating the briefness of life. It was painted by Benjamin uh, Godinez for Isaac Matatia uh, Abo uh, Aboab. So maybe that's the wealthy merchant in this uh, image. On the background, you see more graves. Uh, Crows. It's a, uh, I like this painting, and maybe that's the only reason I bought it here, except for the skull and bones. One more example. This is uh, from the Rodia Mens house in Bet Chaim, Outerkerk, and Amstel. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a house where uh, the Jews of uh, Portuguese uh, Amsterdam commemorated their deaths where they uh, kept awake uh, for their deceased loved ones. And on the wall, you find this, uh, also skull and bones, and above it is an image uh, that says, Caridade escapa do morte. Uh, a, that, that is taken from the Bible, Proverbs uh, chapter 10, verse 2, Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting values, but righteousness delivers from death. I would say that uh, piracy uh, will get you ill-gotten treasures. So, <laughs> in short, it means uh, if you do charity, you may escape death. This is the last slide. It's the first sentence from uh, Kritzer's book. And he tells here about an English captain who invaded uh, Jamaica in 1643, um, way before the, the later invasion of 1655 or 1656. And it was a surprise attack. 
he found uh, the island's capital uh, deserted and undefended, and he happened upon the Quetzal, upon diverse Portuguese of the Hebrew nation who came unto us seeking asylum. And they promised to show us where the Spanish hid their gold. And to the right <clears throat> is uh, probably uh, what uh, Kritzler saw, for he tells us that he cites a passage from a brief journal by Captain William uh, Jackson that he found in the National Library of Jamaica. The original manuscript is in Cambridge. So it's not likely that uh, Kurtzel saw that. He will have seen this publication, which was done by a William Todd Harlow. He transcribed it, published it. And what this citation says, during our bout in town, diverse Portugales, uh, came to us and they had been kept off by ye Spaniards from coming into us to present our service. And uh, what's missing here is Portugales of the Hebrew nation. So in the first sentence of the prologue of his book, and Kritzler manages to uh, get the citation wrong. Um, it has often been said that those Portugals must have been Jews. Could be, maybe not, maybe yes. I have seen no evidence for that, but it's not very much okay to, uh, well, to uh, cite like this. You can see that he put diverse Portuguese of the Hebrew nation, etc., between brackets. And if you use brackets in historical uh, articles or books, that means that you are citing literally, which he didn't hear. I thank you for your attention. I await your questions with pleasure and I apologize for uh, my mistakes here and there in getting names wrong. As I said, they are, they are all Abrahams and Moses and Jacob and it's easy to confuse them. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, Tom. Do you want to close? Oh, you, have, you have closed the uh, thing. I, I, so, so something that I've, uh, I've, I've, I've noticed is I would be expecting sort of academics to uh, to really be jumping on on Ed Kritzler, but uh, you know we hear from people like uh, Stan Mervis and uh, Aviva, who absolutely love the man, so he must have been a great great character. And Ainsley uh, Ainsley Henriquez, who who knew him, uh, is 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 here with us today. Uh, and um, in fairness, I, I I think one of his goals was to promote uh, tourism to. Uh, to Jamaica, and he's probably uh, succeeded uh, in that. But um, at the same time, it does sometimes feel that we spend half our lives sort of firefighting about uh, um, fantasies or, 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 or fringe ideas about Sephardim, be it that whether some surnames are Sephardic, be it uh, you know whole communities in Eastern Europe. There's, of course, the whole debate about uh, sort of uh, whether conquistadors were crypto Jews and uh, and um, so on. But I, I mean, I wonder if 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 this is just a sort of modern phenomenon that um, what, uh, as, as you said at the very outset, that Kritzler is talking about sort of uh, uh, muscular Jews uh, fighting back. And a lot of the, uh, the crypto Jewish stuff is about secret communities suddenly emerging. And I'm, I'm wondering if this perhaps is just a, a post Holocaust um, reaction that, that why suddenly, suddenly now do we have these, these ideas which perhaps didn't exist a hundred years ago? Um, I, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think you're right, but. Um... I don't have much uh, 
insight into that. Um, but you're quite right in, uh, in telling that uh, Ed Kurtz uh, uh, did not get very much uh, academic attention. I've seen only a few reviews here and there. And uh, mostly they were uh, uh, positive. Um, they liked the book, the storytelling. Yeah. Uh, but it seems that academics uh, uh, steered uh, uh, um, around the book and uh, don't take it very seriously, and I think. And, and yet, um, Stan Mervis, who's the most serious of academics, absolutely seems to have loved the guy. So it's, it's, yeah. uh, he it's must have been an extraordinary personality. Too, uh, Um, so just just uh, going through, we 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 had an enormous audience on um, on YouTube from from all over all over the world, including all over the sort of Caribbean and uh, and mm. uh, Suriname, and uh, we even have a uh, a Palash descendant. Um, so I can't see where where he is now. I think in uh, in Oregon and the Western. Um, United States, um, and I, I, I think also it's it's valuable that you sort of highlighted the uh, the huge challenges that um, virtually every every woman at some point seems to be called Maria Nunez, and uh, it is really I, I, I mean even on on my family which has a relatively unusual surname there are sort of Mendozas and Mendonzas popping up. Uh, within the archives, and I have no idea who they are, and it's a great temptation just to to to, to sew everything together and create some great uh, narrative. And um, I, I think this is perhaps why the uh, various genealogical standards that we have are, are so helpful uh, to us. Um, does Does anybody um, have any? Uh, questions. It was a bit of a tour de force. So I'm not really may, sure. May, may I make a couple of comments? First of oh, all, welcome, Ainsley. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I mean, Eddie was my friend all of his life in Jamaica. Yeah. And, 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 and I hate to say it, but I had to bury him. Um, he was such an amazing character. He came here first and foremost as a person to write on the history uh, of the future of, of tourism in Jamaica. He yeah. didn't come here as an academic mm. Jew. And he came from an Ashkenazi family in New York. <clears throat> as we as we explored further, we found all sorts of exciting uh, tracks to, to follow, mm -hmm. um, and 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 you know it was it was really quite an amazing exercise to even research in the archives of Jamaica to find documentation of the 1650s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eddie started to put together what was his effort at a genealogical story of how the Jews settled in Jamaica and what role they played in Jamaica. And the strength of Jewish pirates was to be able to take on the rest of the world and say, hey, we're not just going to hang around and wait to be killed. So it's all part of that story. And, and what you did, Ton, was excellent because you took the story, gave it its credit, but at the same time put facts in place. And at my comment to you before you started, I don't know if you read it, was let the truth be told. <laughs> Eddie's story was a really wonderful story. And he did have many, many friends around the story. But let the truth be told. And that has encouraged us to have a more detailed and investigative relationship with the various changes that took place through your research as to who was who. Now, of course, it affects me principally because I'm supposed to have been a descendant of Moses Cohen Henriquez. And now you've, told, you've destroyed my ancestry. <laughs> so who am I? <laughs> it's, it's, it's still possible because... Uh, no, I know, I, I'm just, I'm just well, making no, the humor of the whole thing. It's still possible because the brother, Isaac, who yes. confessed to the Inquisition in Lisbon, says that Moses had two sons and two daughters. It's just that we don't know where they were. But if you ask me, 
your best chance is another brother, uh, David Cohen now, I guess. Um, well, I, I do go back. I can go back to, to, to Portugal, but that's another story. Yeah. And what, 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 what's interesting is, is the fact that Henrique is such a common Portuguese name yes. that, you know, I, I have to be careful. Otherwise, I'm liberated to too many people. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so, but what Eddie did was to be able to put a story yeah. together. Mm -hmm. that speaks to the power of con Jewish connect connectivity in being mm -hmm. able to fight the various aspects of the Inquisition and the subsequent programs that were uh, exercised against the Jews. True mm -hmm. or false, but it's not important. It was a fact that it's a story that gives us a sense of belonging and strength. Mm -hmm. And so for, for, to that, I think, let us recognize Eddie's role and an interesting place in history. Yes. Uh, can I say something about that? Hi, Ainsley. It's Judith. Hi, hi, Judith. Well, I'm, it's so nice to see you. I'm so sorry I came late, everybody. I was very atypically not right here in the house during COVID times. I was actually in my daughter's car coming back from the country, so I missed a lot. But um, besides loving what you said, Ainsley, and thinking that David should definitely get that story together, you know, I think we need that, that David Mendoza story. And thanks, Tom, as always, for being as clear and well-informed and intelligent about how you set things out. It's wonderful. I just wanted to say two things. Ainsley, I have a memory that Ed Critzler wrote me. We, I was in contact with him shortly after the book came out. And he either wrote me or said in a phone call that he had not wanted to call the book Sephardic Pirates of the Caribbean, but his editor, his publishers had insisted on it. And I've looked through all the correspondence that I've kept, which is a lot. I can't find it. It may have been a phone call. So I just wanted to mention that. But the thing that concerns me a lot, maybe it was discussed before I came in, is I get sort of upset about this folkloric cutesy pirate thing. And to me, it's, you know, on the one hand, yeah, sure, it's a way of showing strength and we don't give in easily and we're somebody, we have our place in the world and we fight back and so on. But it also, to me, kind of belittles. It's this Ashkenazi tendency to exoticize Sephardim and sort of folklorize them. And because there's also this tendency to folklorize and exoticize pirates and turn them into kiddies books and cute songs and put on a patch and International Pirate Day and Yo-Ho-Ho and all this kind of thing. To me, this is like really a sort of belittling of Sephardic culture. You don't say, oh, those cute Ashkenazi pirates. And you actually don't say either, oh, those cute Mizrahi Jewish pirates. It's only Sephardic who are Absolutely. kind of like, you know, these, and I don't know, it kind of bothers me. And Gloria Mound, the late Gloria Mound, who I believe was totally well-intentioned and sincere, propagated a lot of this stuff without really having the tools to go into the historical documents. So there's a lot of things going on, but that's just my perspective. I think you're right, Judith. The, 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 I don't know that it really was started out with a book to be taught, talked about Jewish pirates of the Caribbean, but it certainly was the title that made itself. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Could I say yes, something? There, this is I... a great period in uh, Jewish history because in 1630, there were no Jews in America. And by 1660, they were everywhere. And the story of how they moved and who and where and who was related to who deserves to be uh, uh, researched, um, including uh, uh, Jamaica, Curacao, Suriname, uh, New York. And these communities are all interrelated, all connected to um, back to London, Hamburg, Amsterdam, and before that, Portugal. And it would be really great if that story will be researched in a scientific way, or maybe by uh, David Mendoza too. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tan has made a very set of important points because the, the feature of this conversation here is Jewish pirates of the Caribbean, but reaching out to the various countries that we settled in in the 1650s, 60s is a significant statement to what we were able to achieve, to be allowed to settle, and to, con to contribute to the development of our individual countries. And without a doubt, there's no question about it, 
that the role of the Jews in the, in Curacao, in Jamaica, in Barbados in the early days, and in and in the American coastal towns was significant to the development of trade and commerce and de and, and development generally of, of these parts of the world. So yes, we have a very important role to play. And, and as, 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 as Tan has indicated, it's, it's something else to be discovered, to be researched and to be put into a proper story. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, may I ask some, may I say something? I'm just at the moment. First of all, Tan, congratulations. You did a marvelous job. Um, I would like to say that I enjoyed reading the book for its story. What bothered me was that this book is annotated. So it tends to make one believe that there is real serious research and that the quotations are real. You don't read a book and go check every single quotation when you start reading it. It doesn't make any sense. So that is what bothered me. Better he should have published a book without any quotations and it would have been a great story. Okay. <laughs> But otherwise, it makes it open to this kind of research that Ton uh, uh, proceeded to do for us. And uh, it, it loses a lot of its value in my eyes. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, Bernard, you have a question if you want to unmute. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, Tan. That was fascinating. Um, we run into the perpetual problem of the same names and the same groups of names repeating. Very often, half a generation, a generation, one and a half and two generations apart in similar places, so that checking records becomes even more problematic than it might otherwise have been. I just wanted to share something. I spent most of Friday in the National Maritime Museum in London, where I'd gone to look about information on sailings between Antwerp and London. But the librarian put me down um, at a set of shelves next to the section on pirates, piracy, and um, freeboaters and buccaneers. Um, they had about 300 books on the shelves and a lot more in the archives. And um, I did have a look at them, but it made me come home and look at something that I've been sitting on and not yet read. Um, and this may be of interest to David. A um, hundred years before Ed Critzler's book, a relative of mine, one Clarence Henry Haring, who was a professor of history at both Oxford and Harvard, among other things, wrote a book called Buccaneers of the Caribbean. Um, it is extensively researched and it is, it's the opposite. It's not a storytelling book. He was trying to look at the economics of piracy and what that meant, particularly for Spain and Portugal. There's very little reference to Jews, although he was Jewish, um, but uh, there is extensive analysis of the costs with records of the recorded costs, particularly the losses due to piracy and the profits and losses from piracy. The sources that he uses are mainly, and this is writing between 1900 and 1908. It was published in 1909. Um, so he was using official sources from Holland, France and Britain. And he was looking mainly at um, Dutch, British and French pirates, but also at um, official records. And I have to say it gives the most brilliant explanation of the economics of the discovery of the Americas, of how they maintained them, 
um, of what a drain they were on the resources, particularly of Spain and Portugal, and how subsequently um, France, Holland and Britain were able to come along and benefit largely by stealing from um, I would say the Spanish and Portuguese, but they'd been stealing um, from the uh, resources of and from the indigenous populations. But the book, Buccaneers of the Caribbean, is definitely worth reading. And I tried to do a bit of comparison in Haring's book. He has some useful tables at the end in which he lists some of the ships which were officially registered as either pirate, freeboater, um, filibuster, buccaneer. They all have slightly different definitions. And the filibusters are the most interesting, also known as the freeboaters, because they went out to try almost single-handedly to create countries in their own image or in their own interest, and then sell that interest to um, other countries. And so it's definitely worth reading. And David, the connection is, I found at least three ship captains referred to called Mendoza um, in the indexes of Haring's book. Um, they were Spanish, captains and it may be that somewhere along the way you're related to them i didn't have the time or the resources to start researching them because i only started looking at this book yesterday mm -hmm. um, but i think that reading possibly reading the two side by side and with a lot of other material um a more reliable uh, comprehensive picture may emerge. And I do think that one of the good things about the Kritzler book is it's at least got people reading about the subjects. And yeah. some of them, probably a tiny minority, will go on and do really important research work, which will be valuable in the future. Yeah, no, so thank you. And thank you for, for, um, for that. I will, I will certainly read the book. Um, so can so I just sorry, say on the book, can I just say it, it's out of copyright, so you can get it free on the Gutenberg project, and you can okay. download it in almost any format you like. Many thanks. Uh, so, sorry, Paul, you've been waiting a long time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, quick question. Apart from the discredit, first of all, congratulations. And thank you again to Ton for meticulous and fabulous uh, research and presentation. Um, quick question, apart from the discredited Cohens and Palaches and others who are, if I may interpolate an Ashkenazi phrase, bubamices of a high degree, um, do we know of any other Jewish pirates? Not mentioned by, are they, was there such a thing? I don't think there were, uh... There were many. Lafitte was one. Sorry, did I? was a recognized Jewish pirate, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. it, we were. We, I think what what Ed did was he brought piracy and Judaism together. What I think we also know is that there was a significant amount of, I would say, buccaneering and other activities that took place because. The Caribbean in particular has a much stronger connection with the role of the various European countries against each other. It wasn't just piracy. It was a role that the British fought to be able to license buccaneers before they outlawed them, to be able to deal with the, the shipments of gold and silver from, the cent from Central America to the Spanish Empire. This was also part of a, a totally different context in which Jews were involved, not just in perhaps capturing ships, but also in, in the and trading of the captured yeah. loot. So we had, we had roles to play and Port Royal in the 70, in the 16, late 1600s was the major entrepot, I believe if the correct, if my numbers are correct, at the earthquake of 1692, 200 ships were at anchor in Kingston Harbor. That wasn't a few, Boats. That was a major, major activity taking place in what was then the largest entrepot of the New World. 
Thank you. We understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can we, we we have some, some questions and comments on, on on YouTube? And I'm very aware we've uh, we've over um, extended a bit. Um, Scott asks. Um, Aside from the pirate narrative, how accurate is Critzler's narrative that as a merchant class, Jews were instrumental in the commerce between the new and old worlds? And Tom, perhaps you can answer that in less than about five hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I think, an important, it was an important role. I mean, yeah. we could spend time discussing it in more, much more detail, but it was a very important role. It was important do, during uh, the 17th century. Yeah. And this was because uh, Sephardim had uh, family everywhere. And, and it is known that the Sephardim of Amsterdam also traded with family in Portugal or Spain. Uh, and they had uh, people sitting in um, Barbados, in London. Uh, if you look at um, at these uh, family trees that I uh, uh, that I uh, used in my presentation, you will see that from one family uh, there were people from Brazil, from Tangier, from Amsterdam, and from elsewhere. And another family, there were people uh, who were in Brazil, in Jamaica, in New York, uh, in Amsterdam, in London, and. They had, uh, in this way, they had trade work, uh, trade network where they could rely on their kinsmen for help, um, for uh, correspondence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in that way, it was important. But after 1700, 1750, those family relations uh, faded. The distance began to low uh, in generations and in distance, and uh, some of that network was lost. But they did have a, a role that was somewhat more uh, than proportionate to uh, to the uh, population numbers. Thank you. Um, There's a question also from uh, Mark on on YouTube. Um, who who asks whether you think that there's a similar phenomenon at work with regard to Kritzler's assertions with regard to Abraham Israel de Pisa and his sons? Um, I think uh, they were not related to the Cohen's, and I think that they are still a mystery, and uh, the solution to the mystery will be in the notarial archives of Amsterdam. The more they come online, the more uh, revelations there will be about the, the Pisa family. Um, and maybe there were more than one family with that name. So what I would advise uh, 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 is that everywhere you have documents with uh, the Pisa in it, uh, make a screenshot of the signature uh, beneath the document and turn that into a database of signatures. And that way you may be sure that your Abraham as well, the Pisa in New York is the same that was in Brazil early on or in Jamaica early on. And you need a bit of luck. Uh, you need to find those documents. But uh, there are still a lot to be researched and uh, there's still hope to uh, solve the mystery of the pizza. Thank you. Uh, and there's a, a question from Jose, which is perhaps slightly off topic, um, but uh, he says that uh, Kritzler talks about Columbus, uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, at the beginning of his book. And he asks uh, whether there was uh, Columbus had any role in terms of uh, hiding Jews. I, I suspect that's... Um, uh, that that might be a, a whole different... Uh, a whole different Zoom talk. Yeah, that could be enough. exactly <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, I think um, we, we know that that uh, the island of Jamaica belonged to the Colon family until the English captured it in 1655, and as a result of a number of things, there was no inquisition in Jamaica, so that the 
exercise of inquisition and the testing of faith was not practiced here. So That's as a result of that, the Portugals that you heard about in Ed's book mm -hmm. were people probably of converso origin or anusium origin and may in fact have only practiced Judaism in very private circumstances. We have no evidence that they practiced Judaism before the English capture of Jamaica. So the recognition that Columbus or the Colon family exercised in Jamaica, including the fact that I think in, 16, in 1517, 15, 15 Portugals were brought to Jamaica to start the sugar industry for, 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 for the Spanish. Um, who were these 16 or 15 people? By virtue of their names, we consider them to be conversos. So were they practicing as Jews? I doubt it. If they were allowed to practice as Jews, they would have kept it in the backyard. So it's again, another whole set of stories which requires more work for you, Anton David. <laughs> I have to uh, disagree with that, Ainsley, on the subject of uh, the Columbus family owning the island. They were absentee landlords. They only had the title, and the, know, real, but... the real business in uh, in Jamaica uh, was done by the Spanish government. And if you uh, may have ha read the book by Kundal and Peters, it's a small book, and it has documents from uh, um, from the the archives in Sevilla, and they uh, detail. Uh, they deal with Jamaican history. And from it, you see that the King of Spain had a deep involvement in Jamaica. He was uh, uh, um, abreast of affairs. He, uh, he was interested and he took decisions. And he was, for example, the one who invited... Uh, no, he wasn't the one. The governor of Jamaica invited 30 Portugals to come to Jamaica. Um, the problem is that the book of Kandal and Peters, which is the only source we have, do not tell us if these Portugals indeed came to Jamaica, if they ever arrived. And even Kretzler admit, admits that in a footnote in his book. But you, Are you talking about the Morales Padron book? Uh, no. Have you read that book? No. The Morales Padron book is considered to be the finest history of Spanish Jamaica. Okay. Um, I'll, get that. <laughs> eh? I'll get that and read it. No, no, seriously, look at it. Uh, it's something that I know. And, and in fact, he gave it to us in Jamaica uh, to be able to be published in English. And so I happen to have an English copy. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I don't know that he's still alive, but he was a professor at the university in, in Madrid, I think. Um, so Padron was very conscious of what the role of the Spanish government was. But again, we're looking at a, a, a country that did not have any real economic value to Spain. We mm -hmm. had no gold, no silver, no metals. We were a, basically a, 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 a country with 12 hatos that mm -hmm. were growing cattle and horses for the conquest of Central America. And I argued once with the American ambassador that if we didn't if we hadn't been growing the horses, then you would never have had Hollywood because there would have been no cows and uh, Indians and, and cowboys. So it's, it's a whole story that the role of Jamaica's economy is actually something that also must be looked at in the context of what you have spoken to, Ton. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just... Uh... Typing. Um, I, I think we've sort of massively uh, overextended, but it's, yeah. a, it's a really interesting subject. And I, yes. I, I think the discussion afterwards was uh, wonderful as well. Um, it would be uh, my, 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 my place to thank, uh, thank Ton as our, our, our uh, special guest uh, speaker this week and to thank uh, our patrons for their support. We will uh, be ha back uh, next week, no doubt, sort of uh, crushing somebody's uh, somebody's dreams about uh, some some aspects of of their <laughs> history. But hopefully, uh, hopefully, being uh, informative um, too. And um, Judith, um, 
can I invite you to uh, to sing us out? Sure. I asked David if he could sing. The, you, this is a rare occasion to hear me sing in English. It almost never happens. But ever since I was, oh, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old and heard the first Joan Baez recording, I have sung the ballad of the pirate Henry Martin, who is perhaps the only really polite pirate that I can think about. When the pirate ship says, no, 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 don't do it, he actually apologizes, but he does it anyway. There were three brothers in merry Scotland, in Scotland there lived brothers three. And they did cast lots, which of them should go, should go, should go, for to turn robber all on the salt sea. The lot it did fall upon Henry Martin, the youngest of all the three, that he should turn robber all on the salt sea, the salt sea, the salt sea for to maintain his two brothers and he. They had not been sailing for a long winter's night and part of a short winter's day like today when they did spy a lofty stout ship, stout ship, a stout ship, come a baron down on him straightway. Hello, hello, cried Henry Martin, what makes you sail so nigh? I'm a rich merchant ship bound for fair London town, London town, London town. Won't you please for to let me pass by? Oh no, oh no, cried Henry Martin, that thing it never can be. For I have turned robber all on the salt sea, the salt sea, the salt sea. For to maintain my two brothers and me. So lower your topsail and fire up your men and brow your shelf under my lee. For I have resolved to pirate you here, you here, you here. And your dear bodies drown in the salt sea. So broadside and broadside and at it they went for fully two hours or three. Till Henry Martin gave to them the death shot, the death shot, the death shot. And straight to the bottom went she. Sad news, sad news to fair London came. Sad news to fair London town. There's a rich merchant ship and she's cast away, cast away, cast away. And all of her merry men drowned. Beautiful, thank you. Thank so you having just much. said I didn't like to folklorize pirates, we can end on a story folklorizing pirates. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.